This is Auto Line After Hours, unscripted, uncensored, unapproved. Are you a podcast kind of person? Then look for Auto Line After Hours wherever you go for your favorite podcast. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Borg Warner propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy-efficient world. Hello, everybody. Welcome to AutoLine After Hours. we got a great show today. I can't wait to get into it. Gary Vasilash, not here today. He's out traveling. I believe he's on the, the media launch for the Toyota Prius. Maybe we can talk more about that next week. But this week, right now, we're going to talk about the Cadillac Celestic. I want to bring in a couple of my journal journalism colleagues, Richard Truitt from Automotive News and Frank Marcus from Motor Trend. Great having you guys on the show here today. Thanks for being with us. And let's bring in our special guest, Tony Roma, the chief engineer for the Cadillac Celestic. And Tony, I, I, I'm going to kick it off and then I know Frank and, and Richard will pile on too. But my understanding is that uh, companies like General Motors give a, a brief or an assignment or yeah. How did you come to learn about the Cadillac Celestic? Walk us through how you found out, especially that you were going to be chief engineer on the car. Yeah. Um, good question. Thanks for having me, by the way. Um, so this was an interesting assignment. I was doing the uh, CT5 and CT4 at the time, and um, I got the call to say um, we wanted to take at the time the Escala into production. If you remember that show car that we had debuted at Pebble Beach years ago. And, um, you know, it was time for Cadillac to have a halo car and, um, you know, they, they chose me to be the chief. So we got involved with that. And that was going to be based on the Omega architecture, which was the CT6. And we got far enough along on that, that, that we had a production feasible design, but, but realizing that it was a hybrid and, and that really didn't have the legs going forward or, or the, you know, cast the right shadow really um, knowing where Cadillac was heading. Um, we, we made the decision to be the tip of the spear for GM into electrification. So I think rightfully so we said, you know, look, the Scala is a beautiful car, timeless, but that wasn't the right car for the future. Um, at the time, what is now the Celestic was in the studio as a, a concept uh, clay model. And uh, it was leading the design vision that is the lyric so lyric comes before us but really celestic was designed first and so uh we walked into the studio and said okay we're going to take that you know model in the corner and turn it into a production car and um it it started from there almost four years ago now so it, it started from an idea in a car and and um go go make something epic so what was your reaction when they said tony you're the guy go engineer this thing <laughs> Um, it, it's a little daunting. I'm not going to lie. You know, there's a lot of pressure. This is, uh, important for the brand. We, we have to establish this car credibly. I mean, anybody can make a great car, but, but the whole experience, how we interact with the customers, how people order it, it's got to be relevant. It, it's, it's really challenged every single thing about the way GM does business. And, uh, to be a part of the team that's doing that is quite an honor. These things don't come up very often. And, and really it's like a once in a career thing for sure. Uh, once in my lifetime, if you think about the last time Cadillac did an all clean sheet, you know, um, top line car like this, it was probably the 1950s really. Um, so my background at the time, I, I was not an electrification expert. And I think it was really the, the discussion we had was we wanna make this a great car and you know how to make great cars and it happens to be electric propulsion. And so I've really kind of carried that that idea forward with the whole team. We're, we're here to make an epic car and, and that fits in with uh, Cadillac's vision of electrification in the future. But it's not about being an electric car. It's about being a great car that fits with the brand. And um, yeah, it's it's exciting. No, no pressure, you know. <laughs> what, what was it like to I mean, most General Motors cars are built to a budget that for shareholder value and so forth. And you got a, a really different situation here. Did you have people with muscle memory? There's like, no, no, don't worry about that. You know, you, you got a little more to work with here. 
Yeah, obviously there's still a budget. There's still a business case. We've had to go and get this approved by everyone. So it's not like this was just, you know, here, go burn some money. There's definitely a business case. This. It's not a normal business case. It's not the same kind of thing that you would, uh, that we all deal with in the industry on a normal basis. And like you said, it, it's really everywhere we go, every, every engineer, every, whether we're talking service, or production, um, the, the rate we're going to build these things is around two a day. They're essentially hand assembled by artisans that we've picked and, and have certain skills. Every single aspect of this, we've had to take the best of what we are the be best practices GM has and use that, but really uh, reorient people on what's important to a car when the volume is this low. Because the first thing, and, and it's the easiest one for people to wrap their head around is, piece price isn't as important as investment. You can't amortize the investment in the engineering over volume, which we normally take for granted. And so we find solutions that may be expensive because you're buying uh, hand finishing or, or whatever. But when you add up the business case, you say, okay, we'd rather do that than invest in dyes and, and molds and other things. So we've come up with a lot of really, really creative solutions with that in mind. And, and it's going to pay dividends in a in an interesting way on other products, it's going to let us do some other niche versions of other products in the future. So it's been a great experience. Tony, I wanted to ask you a question about the crew that you have selected to build the Celestic. If I remember correctly, the last hand-built car GM made was the EV1. That was almost 25 years ago. Did you have any talent in-house or did you get people from other automakers or how did you find the people who have the skills to build the Celestic? That's a great question. We actually have a number of people uh, involved with this project that worked on the EV1. Uh, my, my boss, Brandon Vivian, worked on EV1. My program engineering manager um, worked on the EV1 and, and a number of people involved with the manufacturing and engineering of the car. But um, the, the actual people that are going to assemble the car, and we've announced all this, it's, uh, we took a, a section of our pre-production or prototype facility in Warren. And so the the first pool of people that we went to to be assemblers were the people that were building our hand-built prototypes for years and years. Okay. So who better to assemble a very special vehicle that needs special care and feeding than people that have been doing that for years and years? It, it's a little different than what they've been doing. Obviously, a prototype version of a whatever is a little different than a, than a handcrafted car like this. But mm -hmm. the mentality is the same. They understand building something special and and taking their time and, and getting it right. So we we didn't go outside. This has all been in house. Our manufacturing team's done all the engineering and and uh, uh, setting everything up. And, and it's our facility and our workforce. So yeah, we we looked at it. I'm not gonna lie. We did benchmark and look at what others have done, like what Ford did with the GT. But at the end of the day, this is sort of a source of pride for us, right? This is all in house, and you know we didn't just write a check and put our badge on it. So Tony, you mentioned two two cars a day. They're about four hundred a year, something like that, right? Was that the plan from the get go? I mean, how how did that thinking all come about? That you know, it had to be super low volume, very low uh, capex going into it. And uh, walk us through the the whole thought process that brought you to where you are. Maybe not all the thought process, but the thumbnail version. Yeah, it, it, to walk through all of it would require quite a bit of time. You can imagine, but. Um, you know, you, you sit down at the beginning and you, you get the stakeholders together um, from the brand, from, you know, kind of what engineering resources do we want to invest? What, how can we manufacture this thing? What business case makes the most sense? And just like every other product I've ever worked on, you know, uh, marketing wants a car they can sell for a dollar and the studio wants something that's made from billet and granite and, and wrapped in the most expensive thing you can find. And uh, manufacturing wants it to jump out of the dunnage and assemble itself. So other than that, you know, we're fine. Um, so we, we quickly coerced around exclusivity is important in this segment, no matter what we charge, whether it's 150,000 or, or over 300, like we landed. One of the things we heard from potential customers was uh, when we talk about other cars that Cadillac had done over the years is they don't want to come to a dealership and see a whole bunch of them lined up in front of a dealership with every color of the rainbow. That, that just destroys the image of exclusivity. And frankly, um, along this journey, we've uh, benchmarked Rolls-Royce and Bentley, and, and I've gone to the dealerships to order and, and to pick up those. And when you go to a, a Rolls-Royce dealership and you look around, they have barely any cars around. You walk around the back of the dealership, most of them have 10, 12, 15 of them somewhere on the property, but they literally hide them away for that exact same reason, right? So low volume was part of it. 
And then the rest just kind of works out in the wash, right? You, you don't need to be able to build thousands of something. You don't want to invest in industrializing it that way. So we sort of landed on and, and we're, you know, we haven't committed to any exact numbers. We do have some flexibility, but when we say in the range of two a day, and, and really it's all just about exclusivity. We want to make sure when you order your car, and, and I'm sure we'll talk about customization here in a minute, um, we want to make sure this is something personal to you and that, you know, your neighbor down the street doesn't end up with the exact same combination of everything that, that is literally not possible to happen in this case. Tony, normally when a car is um, through the product development process, the engineers let it go and then the manufacturing guys take over. But this might be a little different in that a customer could come and want something really special that might need a little engineering. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. We have a plug in our business case for a certain amount of workload through the entire life cycle. And we've staffed people to you know field those requests and that's going to be a bit of a dialogue, right? Because you may think you want something special, but it may be more expensive than you realize. Um, so we're we're but we're we're willing to have that discussion with people. And so yeah, we're we're definitely this is not a launch and leave kind of activity. We're, we're going to be involved, and my team's planning on sticking with this thing. And that's part of the advantage of having it built at the tech center. It's right across the street from the studio and and from our engineering center. Here's what I. Oh, I'm sorry. Here, here's what. <laughs> Go ahead. Here's what I really wanted to ask you, Tony. You've obviously driven the car. Give us a flavor of what it's like. It's it's fantastic. The first day um, we got to drive the car and we had uh, what's called a knothole ride. You guys may have heard of that. We do this thing with Mark Royce and, and his staff where we drive the cars. And it's a day I, I, I know I won't forget. And I know Mark made some comments that he won't either. Um, the car's fantastic. I mean, not only I think it's gorgeous. It's got proportions that are just epic when you see this car in in the real world with other vehicles around it. It, it is striking, um, but it drives uh, the word that kept being used by all the executives when they drove it was athletic. And I think that's appropriate. And it's kind of shocking when you think about how big the car is. But all the technology we put into the chassis and, and all the work we've done, uh, we still got a long way to go. We're not done tuning it yet, but but it's fantastic to drive. It's quiet. It's uh, it, it's nimble, with active rear steer. It can actually turn around on a dime. Um, it's a fantastic car. It's going to blow everybody away. Tony, most of the big sedan kind of cars like this that are electric that we're familiar with have the big battery that's in the entire floor. Yours is centralized along the spine, kind of around the roll axis. Can you tell us a little bit how that changes the dynamics, a little bit less roll inertia or something? How does that, how do we feel that? Yeah, so it's it's along the floor. So it's a multi-height battery. So there's there's cells all under the front passengers. Uh, we stack the, the same uh, Altium cells. It, um, we we kind of joke in breakfast food terms, but in the Lyric, they're toast, right? They're stacked up on end. And in our car, they're pancakes. And so we distributed the pancakes. And what you see when you look at the battery is we, we double stack them along the spine, like you say, but most of the weight is down low and under the floor. Okay. We had to hollow out the rear passenger footwell to be able to get the rear seat, the height that you want to get your heel down. So you're not you know eating your knees when you're sitting in the back of the car. So that's that gave us the flexibility and the battery to do all that, and we took up some some room that would be center console otherwise to fill in even more battery to get enough enough capacity. So you you brought up the the point of customization. Let let's talk about that because uh, you're going to or Cadillac will assign a designer to a customer mm -hmm. if they want to go and take the car off in whatever direction they want to take it. Right? How how far can that go? I mean. <laughs> Clearly, you, you know, there's nice little touches that you can do on the interior. Uh, what if somebody wanted to change body panels? Could they even do that? Um, our mantra from very early on is we don't want to tell anybody no. We want to tell you how long and how much, right? Um, and so, uh, but, but the how much, as you guys well know, if you want to change body panels or lighting or exterior things, that gets to be really expensive if you just are going to build one. So I doubt we'll end up actually doing that, but we will explain to people what, what it would take if they wanted to. Roughly the way the process is going to work is um, you're going to get assigned a concierge to help you construct your order and, and pick the options, kind of the regular options, if you will. And then there's opportunities to personalize, and then there's opportunities to truly customize. 
if you feel you need help from one of our designers, then like you mentioned, somebody will get assigned to it and, and vet out, okay, you really do want enough customization to warrant this. It's it's an expensive option for us to assign someone. It's 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 a commitment on that buyer's part. But I'm really excited to see how far people want to go with this. You know, different materials. We, um, you know, we've talked to people about all sorts of things. You know, different woods from their grandfather's. You know, orchards or, or uh, you know, uh, floor mat material inspired from you know all sorts of crazy areas. So I, I'm really excited in a year to come back and talk about what things did we blast for and what were we able to do. It's going to be a really cool story. On that front, though, I mean. You know, when you're going to put a material in the lyric, there's all kinds of UV testing and all this kind of durability and so forth. To what extent do we say, all right, you know, the, the Celestic's going to be in the garage. It's, you know, it's not going to, uh, some of that we don't have to worry about, but like even like, especially like exterior paints. I know certain paints, you know, need extra work. To pigments don't work mm -hmm. out. Is there any worry that, you know, one of these things is going to fade or? Or something like that or are they dyed in the in the composite or i mean talk a little bit about yeah. what you got to do to make some of those things happen so we've talked about all of that and that's always one of the first things that comes up and um i've talked to someone that has a silk headliner in another brand of car and of course that's not going to last forever it pretty much starts decaying the minute you put it in the car right and he said when he bought it they came to him and said hey this will probably need redone in five years pretty much no matter what you do with the car no problem. He signed up for that when he bought it. So that's the kind of discussion we need to have with our customers up front that what I'll call the the, the, the standard options that, that we've engineered and, and we're going to offer to people are validated in the manner like you mentioned, right? That there are things that you would expect to find in a car. We've tested them for UV. They may not all be the highest, most durable uh, thing, but but they're reasonable, I'll just say, right? That they pass reasonable tests. If you want to do something that's a lot more fragile, like I've told my team, because we've had some requests already that are interesting. Some people put white carpet in their dining room. Now, I'm not that guy, <laughs> but some people do. And if that's what you want, um, no problem. We're going to explain to you, hey, be careful if you get you know pasta sauce on this, it's, it's going to stain. But that's what people want. And we want to enable that. And so that'll be part of the dialogue with the customer. Tony, let's talk about some of the engineering in the car. One of the things I'm intrigued by are all these different castings. Tesla calls them giga castings. You guys refer to them as mega castings. But it looks to me like there's essentially six castings that form the structure of the car. I'm intrigued by this approach. And it's got to be something different than you've ever dealt with, at least in production cars. Yeah, no question. When when the team we we mentioned a minute ago about you know low low volume means low investment if you if you want your business case to work out and we've been able to tool the the underbody the basic floor of the vehicle is made from those six large castings and there's two other large castings in the front that kind of hold the headlamps and the corner structure together they're held on with some extrusions that are the crash structure so it's really the whole lower structure is castings and extrusions. Um, and that was driven by flexibility of the design, right? We, we can make changes extremely fast and, um, and, and low investment. And so when the team came to us with this idea, um, it was a real, a real game changer. It let us get into production extremely quickly too, because the partner that we're working with can 3D print the sand cores. They have a machine. I, I think that is so cool. I, that, <laughs> 3D cool. printing the sand cores. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, they, they 3D print the sand cores, then they pour the aluminum in it. So we were able to get parts turned around on, on some of our pieces. Like uh, I know we had a rear uh, rear cradle concept with a hollow aluminum rear cradle. I think we sent them math on a like Wednesday and we had the parts sitting on the ground heat treated by like Monday of the following week. I mean, just incredible. Um, so, so a follow up there because, you know, uh, the, the belief in the industry has been that Tesla locked up all the the cast or the, the machinery for doing those kind of castings with Idra, the Italian company. Uh, now you guys are doing it. Now, maybe there's a big difference between high volume production like Tesla's doing it and, and the way you guys are doing it. But how are you getting these extremely large castings when supposedly Tesla had locked up all the machinery to do it? Um, I don't want to go too deep into it, but I can tell you these are done in the U S um, it's done here in Southeast Michigan. Um, 
this is a different process. T Tesla and others are really focused on higher volume, low cycle time, you know, die casting, high pressure. It's it's different. This is the type of um, process you would use to vet out uh, a process like that. You would make these as prototypes for your higher volume die. Um, we're just skipping that second step and we're just going to keep buying uh, the, the sand cast parts. And we don't 3D print the sand cores forever, right? We, we, we hard tool the parts that make sense and we're still 3D printing some of the inner uh, pieces of the core, but um, that's really where this technology is useful on a on a larger scale. It's useful to prove out your your casting concepts that you're going to then go invest in really expensive dyes. So, so one more follow up, then I'll let Richard jump in. But uh, what do you think for future cars? I mean, Tesla has proven that these mega castings are a big step forward in manufacturing efficiency. You, what have you guys learned from doing this? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can tell you just from my experience, I, I, you know, I'm not going to speak about Tesla, but um, our very first body that we assembled with this technology, the whole body met the dimensional metrics that would have been good enough for it, us to exit the prototype phase, the very first one we put together. And it absolutely stunned everyone involved, like, whoa. And really, when you think about it, right, you're you're taking a casting, you're you're machining it indexing it together and welding it together i mean yeah it should be very precise and it is so that alone is is huge in how how fast you can go and then like i said the the speed of change you know oh we need a different tapped hole there we need a different thing here obviously when you invest in the die it becomes more difficult to change but in this phase we're in when you prototype it and, and they're sand cores it's I'm not going to say it's trivial to change, but it's a lot easier than changing a die casting. So I think this this is a process that you'll see used more in the industry for sure. There are places where it makes a lot of sense. I'm not sure it's the answer to everything. I don't I'm I'm not sure we're not going to stamp metal anymore. Uh, I don't I'm not going to go that far, but there's definitely applications. This makes sense. Tony, I hate to bring this up, but the fact of life is some of these cars are going to get wrecked and going to get in, in accidents. How serviceable are those mega castings? Um. Yeah, that's a great question. We've been working with our team. Really, when you get into the kind of accident that's going to get into one of these castings, it's it's very, very, very serious anyways. And we already have similar pieces of a vehicle. If you look at the front of a CT5, it has a very large cast node on the front that the front uh, uh, um, no, uh, strut goes to. So we already deal with that servicing castings in, in the field like that. So, um, but, but you're right. It is one of the complexities you need to think about. And having the proper tools and body shop in place in the field to handle um, what would have been a minor collision in a car like this becomes a project, right? So we talked about the, the castings. Let's talk about some of the body panels. I mean, they're, they're all carbon fiber, right? And uh... Most of the body panels are carbon fiber. They're all applied. So what you see as the skin of the car um, is not the actual body and weight. Nothing is, is visible. It's all uh, applied panels. So it's either glass, carbon fiber, and then the doors are um, SMC, the doors are SMC. Right? Yeah, the only, and they're only not carbon because uh, we have a radar unit that, that looks through the door and it can't see through um, carbon. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to apply anything. We didn't want to have like a faux door handle or anything. So that was really driven by styling, not, not having a, a, a line, a cut line on the door. So we chose SMC, but they're, yeah. Was that a challenge at all in terms of thermal expansion? You don't want those door gaps changing with the weather. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's okay. I mean, we're making them thick enough SMC, and it has a similar coefficient of expansion to the rest of the car with the aluminum structure. So it, it's that's not a problem. We've got really so it's, tight door it's gaps. It's different stuff than Saturn doors. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's way. The technology's come a long way since then. Yeah. Tony, I can't believe nobody's asked you about the drivetrain yet. Tell us about, is it all wheel drive permanently or how is that gonna work? Yeah, it's, it's um, the drive units are similar to the Lyric. So it's a two motor uh, drive system, front and rear um, that, that hand off based on drive conditions and depending on what you're asking for regen. Um, so yeah, it's it's all time, all wheel drive. It's, you know, it doesn't ever just use one axle or the other. Okay. Can you tell us what kind of power you've got there in total? Pretty sure we've announced that it's over 600 horsepower. So, so you said the car is athletic. You know, is it is it pretty quick? Oh yeah, it's very quick. It's it's faster in a straight line than a CT5 Blackwing. So, um, I, I explained to people you're not going to be disappointed. Um, 
yeah, it's it's not a 2.2 second, you know, car that was never its mission, but it's definitely not disappointing. It's, uh, Wealthy yeah. people sometimes uh, are chased by bad actors, so I presume this will be a pretty good vehicle uh, for <laughs> evasion. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Four people can evade in luxury, right? So those of us who who have lived here in or live here in Detroit, I saw the Hummer about a year before it came out. When are we going to start seeing the Celestic around town? Um, we've we've been out in public roads with them. So if you were in the right place, I know the first time we went out of the proving grounds, I got my picture taken, and, and those are floating around. So. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we're out doing development. I know uh, we've got cars uh, in the desert right now. We're getting ready to send cars up north. So it, all the usual places, the car will be doing what development cars do. Okay. Okay. With three, other, other, or three or 400 cars production, how many prototypes do you fully build out to drive around? Yeah, we we had that discussion a lot. You know, we're not going to build a year's worth of production <laughs> just to validate the car. So, um, I don't remember the exact number, but but it's low. It's low by a uh, full uh, all new major program uh, levels. But but there's a lot of physical integration that still has to happen. I mean, um, you, when you when you're obsessing over noise and vibration and ride and handling and and all these things, there's still there's still you got to build the car and test it and and iterate. Those of us who attended the uh, media preview got quite a light show when they turned it on. Is there any new and interesting lighting technology going on there? Um, boy, that's a great question. So we've got lighting in the roof. I don't know that anybody else has ever done that where we light the, the edge of the laminated panel and it kind of goes in with the pattern that we put into the, to the, yeah, you can see it there in that picture. That's a good example. Um, um, I don't know. That's a great question. I'm I'm not really ready to say like I can't off the top of my head. I can't think of new. It's just the best of everything. Individually addressable segments in places where where other programs use maybe turning on a whole strip of LEDs. We can individually address the the color and 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 intensity of each light. So when you see the the animation on the car, it's much more fluid and and flowing than than other cars. Strictly just because we could afford. You know, and then the number of LEDs we have on the car is insane. I forget the number off the top of my head, but it's literally thousands of LEDs all over the car. So as as you've got these cars and you're testing them in different environments and the like, I mean, what what are you shooting for here? Well, how do you want the Celestic to drive and how does it separate from the rest of the Cadillac lineup or any of the other exotic luxury cars out there? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'd say the, the words we use, you know, it's got to be quiet. It's got to be competent, competence inspiring. Um, it's not a sports car, but but again, right, it's got to be competent at what it does. When you ask it to turn, it, it, it can't just flop over. And um, But then when, when you're on a straight road and you want it to, to ride over things, it's got a lot of ride travel, active roll control, lets the wheels move independently, not toss your head around. So it, it's got to be competent at doing everything it's got to ride well it's got to handle well enough that you feel confident in the car and that's what's come across and when you drive the car that's this big and this low and, and everything else and you look at the wheels and tires and you think oh my gosh it's going to be noisy or it's going to be it's going to hit every impact i'm going to be able to feel every tire strip and then you're very pleasantly surprised when you realize nope we've engineered all that in and it sucks up the uh, bumps in the road and and the suspension moves incredibly athletically um, well, eventually we'll put some videos out of the cars going over some of these big swells. And even when you just watch it from the outside and you see the wheels moving, uh, the team is doing a fantastic job of taking advantage of what the chassis has, all the inherent goodness. And um, I'd say it's not really separate from the rest of the Cadillac brand. It's just like the styling. It's really the ultimate expression of what the rest of the Cadillac brand is going for. We're not trying to tune this to be different. It's it's really the best of what we, what we want. Mm -hmm. We were told that production would start, but about a year from now, is that still on track? Yep, still on track. That's great. Hey, look, we're we're at uh, the bottom of the hour right now. Let's take a quick commercial break. We'll come back. I know we've got a lot more things that we'd love to talk about on the Cadillac Celestic. How do Bridgestone tires stop shorter on wet roads? It's their hydro track technology, but you don't have to know how the science works, just where the brake is. What really matters is their Bridgestone. The world is changing at an ever-increasing pace. No matter what the mode of transportation, there is always the need for an efficient propulsion system. 
And that's exactly what Borg Warner has been doing since the earliest days of the automotive industry. All right, we're back talking all about the Cadillac Celestic with the chief engineer of the car, Tony Roma. Uh, Tony, uh, you're, you're building so much of this in-house, but you still got to buy some things from suppliers. What's it like going to them and say, hey, guys, we need two a day. <laughs> and they go, what? I mean, yeah. how, how do you convince a supplier to supply components and, and systems on such low volume? Yeah, that's another good example of every single piece of this has been a little bit of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, in some cases, you go to suppliers that do this, right, that, that work on other well-known luxury brands in super low volumes. In other cases, you go to partners that General Motors uses on other high volume products and you say, hey, we've got this quote for a whatever. Can you help us out on this one? I can tell you honestly, though, it's been a mixed bag because in some cases, suppliers are excited to be a part of a project like this. That, that has really come through and we've got some great partners. Um, other cases, we've definitely had to, you know, hey, well, you know, here, here's this other piece of business. Uh, help us out on this one. And then in other cases, we've gone directly to people that are kind of known for making low volume. But it's been um, it's been an interesting discussion and it really breaks a lot of our young purchasing people's minds when they look at the numbers. <laughs> You're paying how much for seats? Like, yeah, no, that's is that a whole car set? No, that's that's one seat, you know, so it's, it's been interesting. So, Tony, uh, GM has spent billions on its 3D printing technology. Uh, is this a dry run for something bigger, perhaps down the road? If you guys can making more than 100 parts for the car, and even though they'll be low volume, um, does this sort of prime the pump for you to take that up to higher volume on another program? Yeah, that's a that's a great point. Yes, it absolutely does. Um, and and I use a couple examples for that. Like a lot of what we're doing, a lot of what we use additive for are the obvious 100 parts that are that are going to be in the the retail car. But then a lot of what we're using additive for are check fixtures, assembly fixtures, all sorts of things behind the scenes that that normally cost sometimes tens of thousands of dollars that we've been able to save on just a couple of components. That's that's a huge one just to open our manufacturing team's mind of what's possible. Um, and then, um, like, for instance, the D ring, the reaction ring that the front seatbelts use that's on the B pillar is a 3D printed stainless steel part. And the process of going through and validating that and, and doing all the safety validation and everything else, it just helps put that expertise on the shelf for us when we want to go apply it anywhere else. And and uh, all of those hundred parts have done some of that. And it's and it's definitely priming the pump. And there's it, it's it's an exponential curve, right? We're, the hundred parts we're doing in, in low volume is going to is going to lead to hundreds of parts in tens of thousands very soon. Right. On other I, I, programs. Talk a little bit more about that D-ring because, you know, I've got some uh, 3D printed parts on my desk. You know, I've been at trade shows and things and they, they, they give these things out. But man, if you drop them, they shatter. I mean, there's no strength to them whatsoever. <clears throat> and I got to believe that that D-ring that holds the, the shoulder belt in place, part of FMVSS, right, regulations, it, it's got to be subjected to entirely or, or very high loads in an accident. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had no idea idea that 3D printed parts could, you know, be safe enough to use in that kind of an application. Well, I'm not going to lie to you. When they came to me at first and said they wanted to do this one, I, I kind of had the same reaction you did. Like, you want to do what? <laughs> like a safety critical part like this? But, um, you know, we, we had a backup plan of another part. And so we we took this on the, the safety team and the and the additive team were excited to use this as a as a case study. And it's worked out fantastically. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I know for sure when we tested the D-ring to failure, it's well strong enough that you could lift up the entire car and then some <laughs> with it to your point about, about strength. Um, so we thought that'd be kind of a funny thing to put out in a little video of like lifting up an entire Celestic with the, one of the D-rings. Um, but but yeah, it's really, it's, it's, um, the, the technology is changing so fast and, you know, you laser center the material and then you heat treat it and, and, and then you finish it and, um, it's exciting stuff. It's, it's going to get used in a lot of places, um, all over, all over cars. So speaking of FMVSS, how will one of these be crashed into a wall or can you, with this volume, are you allowed to just do this by computer or showing computer testing? 
Um, man, that's a great question. It's like you were listening into my conference calls this morning. Um, no, we we are definitely going to uh, run some confirmatory crash tests for sure. There and besides the fact that there are many many places around the world that you absolutely must and you must do witness testings where you have someone from a regulatory body that that watches us run it into the wall. Um, so no, we're, we're definitely going to run. I'll call it the minimum number of them. And, and a lot of these cars get used for more than one, you know, so maybe we hit one in the right front corner and then set up a different test and hit it in the left rear door or something, right? Just in an effort to be efficient. Um, and we're working towards and trying to prove capability of the analytical stuff with the regulators. But um, yeah, we're not quite in a world where you can do this analytically yet. Right. Tony, this is such a unique program for GM. I'm just wondering, is this the biggest challenge of your career so far? Oh yeah, no question. I, I've I've done a lot of really interesting things, worked on you know V series and Corvettes and Camaros and all sorts of fun stuff racing. This is by by a long shot the biggest challenge for me. Yeah. Are you having fun? Yeah, absolutely. This is awesome. I'm like, uh, I think I said at the beginning, I mean, how many times does somebody walk in and say, hey, go do an all new clean sheet of paper that's going to define a brand going into the next, it's next century. Um, yeah, it's awesome. I'm, I'm a huge, my, my family was a GM family. Nobody worked at GM, but my grandfather was a huge Buick guy who, who always talked about that Cadillac that he wanted to buy, right? He was that generation. And so um, the opportunity to do this with Cadillac is awesome. So. What's keeping you up at night, though, about the project? We always know there's something. Yeah, yeah. Um, just getting getting things like the software done on time and getting enough material to do the testing on time. I'd say it's pretty standard things that keep a chief engineer at this phase in, phase in a program up. There aren't any technical things that that worry me. I know a lot of people are surprised to hear me say that with all the unique solutions we have. From what I've found is those things that we've like the D-ring we talked about, those things that we're taking risk on, people are overcautious and we're, we're doing way more belt and suspenders work um, that's going to make that work out. So it's more the normal blocking and tackling that, that kind of keeps me up at night. We, we've talked a lot about the car, but uh, you're, you, GM is using this to, to really pioneer new technology too, right? I, so everybody knows Super Cruise is coming out, but I believe Ultra Cruise is going to debut on the Celestic. You've got some really interesting stuff going on in the, the glass roof, right? Where each individual in the car can, what, set it for the level of opaqueness or, or not that they want. Tell us about some of the other things that might be going on that you're pioneering with the Celestic. Yeah, you mentioned Ultra Cruise. The, uh, the the obvious one is the display, the 54-inch display across the front with the privacy screen for the passenger side, so you can uh, you can watch video or, or cast your phone or do whatever you want. Um, and that, that's just one big, long-looking screen. It's not multiple screens stuck together like somebody else it, is doing. It's not multiple screens. It's two different uh, LCD displays because one of them has the privacy screen and, and one doesn't, but it's under one piece of glass, and it's and it's a freeform shape, so it's not square displays under a piece of curved glass. It's actually curved displays that that have that that halo shape across the top. Um, so it's you know designed for this application. We didn't take off the shelf displays and put them under glass to do this. Um, that's the special thing about it. Um, yeah, I mean, I mentioned active roll control, which is not new technology to the industry, but it's new for us. Uh, we've got a 48 volt system that does the front and rear. Uh, uh, light um, glass uh, heat, uh, heating for, for de-icing and things like that. The roof you mentioned with the pattern and the lighting and and the individual quadrants that have four different levels of opacity. So you can dim the roof just above you or the whole roof or just the back seat or whatever you want. Um, gosh, I could go on and on and on. I mean, it's it's packed with. We talked about the LEDs. There's over 2,000 LEDs all over the car. You can choose different colors and animations and all all sorts of things. Um, and yeah. do your, your counterparts on some of the, well, they're all lesser series of Cadillacs and everything else, have their eyes on certain parts of this car thinking, okay, you've proven it out. Now all we got to do is, you know, bring down the cost of them. Are we going to see a lot of some of these other technologies work their <laughs> way into uh, lesser Cadillacs? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is yes, absolutely. And um, we, we meet with, as a brand, all, all of myself and my peers meet and talk about where these things make sense. 
Um, so yeah, you're going to see a lot of this stuff uh, work its way in, and it may not be the direct technology we're using because it's expensive or, or, or doesn't lend itself to scaling up, but it'll be something similar, maybe the next generation of whatever. So. So we've got a, a number of questions that came in here from the audience. How about if we do sort of like a, a rapid fire approach to, to them and then we'll get back to questions with uh, Richard and, and Frank here. Uh, Landon Thomas wants to know uh, if the Celestic is going to be available in right-hand drive. Hmm, good question. So no, uh, no plans for right-hand drive. We are going to sell in Japan and and in uh, the UK, but but we'll sell the left-hand drive car with right-hand uh, lamps. Okay. He also wants to know, uh, what about a two-door touring poop off this or a Continental GT? I mean, if you're doing it low volume like the, you're, you're doing, I imagine there's all kinds of variations you could do. Yeah, the sky's the limit. And I can tell you the studio guys are salivating at even just the question, right? Um, and I would love to do that. But but what I'd say is let us get this one out the door first. And then uh, let's let's see how well it's really accepted. And then we'll we'll go from there. Okay, Lambo 2015 wants to know, from a service standpoint, servicing the car, do you have to approach this different than you do high volume vehicles? Um. Yes and no. I mean, it's still servicing a customer vehicle, which is important that you do that right, um, whether it's this car or their Lyric or whatever. Um, we are going to have certified dealers. So dealers are going to have to apply to be a Celestic dealer for sales and service. And there's going to be training and things that go along with that. Um, and like the ability to pick up and, and drop off the vehicle from the customer's uh, home or, or wherever they are. So um, we're, we're, we're keeping the customer experience in mind at every single facet. So. Yeah, uh, we, we already talked about uh, the new technology that's debuting. Uh, Ed Dobbins wants to know, is that going to continue? For example, would Celestic uh, be used as the first car to get the next generation Ultium batteries? Yeah, I mean, I want to talk about future product too much, but I can tell you that that would be awfully logical that we would continue to be the uh, technology halo for the brand in the future. So. Uh, Rick Ambrose is raising a question here that I've heard from other people. As you said, the Celestic was designed first, but the Lyric came out first. Mm -hmm. A lot of controversy about that. Some people believe the Halo car should come out first because what uh, Rick is asking here is, you know, uh, looks like the Celestic is trickling up, you know, to the Lyric in people's minds that didn't know the, the order in which it was designed. A any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, you could talk. We could talk a long time about that. There's a lot of reasons why uh, Lyric is going to come first. Um, some of the technology needed to be designed for Lyric so that we could borrow it, like the drive units. You know, we, we didn't want to drive the design on the low volume car and then try and apply it to high volume. So by the time a lot of that stuff was baked and, and how we were going to scale batteries and the whole Ultium system, it takes a long time to do a bespoke structure and, and all the new things we're doing on Celestic. So that's why Celestic is later than Lyric. And so, uh, yeah, that, that's the short answer. Okay, two more. Uh, uh, Robert Stewart says, uh, building cars by hand, uh, there could be a lot of risk of defects. So uh, do you go through more quality gates in the assembly of this vehicle? Yeah, that that is for sure. We We've got... Yeah, the, the, the short answer is yes. We go through all the steps you would expect and make sure you build it right the first time. <coughs> and then, of course, there's a quality check at the end of the line that's really just rechecking that you did everything. But there's in-station checks. Um, we're, we're obsessed about the suppliers sending us the right material. So there's checks at the supplier. There's checks when they get to PPO. So, yeah, we're hypersensitive to not having to take the car back apart once we put it together. Okay, one last one, then back to Richard and, and Frank here. He says, uh, what percentage of Celestics do you think will actually be driven versus put in a museum or a collection? <laughs> um, boy, that's a great question. I can tell you most of the people we've talked to in our what we've been calling whisper events over the last uh, more than 12 months, um, I do expect most of these people to drive their cars. Um, yeah, sure, some of them will end up in a collection, um, but that doesn't mean they won't get ever driven. That just means, you know, a lot of these folks have 10, 12 plus cars. So it's not like they're looking for a daily driver and we don't expect this to be their daily driver. 
Um, but I think every, I think the customers will all get them out and enjoy them. I would. I mean, who would not want to roll up to some fancy event in a Celestic? Right. I agree. What's the most important thing you've learned working on this project, Tony? Um, just to keep an open mind and uh, let people bring, empower people to bring interesting solutions, right? Tell, focus them on what the problem you want solved and, and let them be creative and come back and listen to what they have to say. Things like the castings in the floor, um, we all had to keep a very open mind about how to solve that problem of doing that affordably and, and with quality and, and um, yeah, it had to empower the right people to get a little crazy and um, find a solution that maybe was expensive that we didn't like and then iterate to the final solution that we're going to use, right? Is there a little bit of a strategic rollout in terms of, are you guys courting the, the certain people that are influencers and so forth? And I, is it safe to say that you're probably going to know a lot of the owners of this car or where you maybe never knew an owner of previous cars you've chief engineered? Um, I mean, yes, the process we're going to use. I mean, we already have quite a few hand raisers, um, like many, many more than we're going to be able to build in the first year or 18 months. So, yes, we're going through the process of, you know, who's the right person to have it and yeah, who, who's going to be the right person for the brand? That That's something, honestly, I'm not even involved in. There's a whole different group of people that are going to figure this out. It's a fantastic problem to have that we have so much interest. But um, yeah, I, I think you're spot on. I think you're going to know a lot of the people that end up getting these cars. Their, their names will be known. Let's put it that way. So, Tony, since this is a low volume car and you got to do it differently, you got to keep costs down. Are you doing this with a much smaller engineering team than you would on a uh, on a high volume car, or is or is it roughly the same? Um, roughly the same. It's it's definitely smaller in some aspects. Like for the interior, we've tried to condense all of the wrapped parts down to basically the same person. Where normally you'd have like one person doing the overhead and one person doing the doors and one person doing this, and so we've we've condensed just to uh, streamline them getting up to speed with processing and working with the same supplier. But then at the end of the day, we've really done our best of leveraging the, the larger GM enterprise. So um, portions of people's time in the safety space or wherever, and it ends up being a, a large number. So it's, yeah, it's probably a little bit less than a normal car, but, but not shockingly less. You, you mentioned uh, automatic roll control. Uh, how's that work? And four wheel steering. Uh, I got to believe with a car this long, you've got four wheel steering on it too. Yeah, no question. Four wheel steering was not even negotiable from the beginning when the wheelbase is this long, turn circle would have been uh, laughable. Um, so, yeah, four, four wheel steering, active roll control is a, a 48 volt motor that's in line with the, the stab bar that can that can go in phase or out of phase with what way the wheels are moving. So you got a computer that's looking at what is the car trying to do, um, algorithms that, that work in conjunction with the dampers and the air springs to say, are we trying to control the head toss? Are we trying to you know, hold the platform stable? Are we trying to let a wheel go down into a pothole? All sorts of wizardry going on, real-time models of the car as it's going down the road. Um, it's it's And it's working just fantastic. We That's really another good news story. We talked about virtual. We tuned all of this on our driver in the loop um, simulator at Milford. That, that's our state-of-the-art that we use with our racing team and others. And we tuned ride with it. I actually had my first ride in a Celestic virtually in the simulator, driving down some of our ride roads at the proving grounds that we've mapped out. And then you get in the car a month later and you're like blown away. Like I've never, never thought we could use that technology. And the car came out incredibly well tuned right out of the box, having never seen any hardware. It's fantastic. So, you know, go ahead, Richard. I was going to say we're a year out from, production. So safe to say that 90% of the engineering or more is done. Uh, the suppliers are lined up. What what happens in the next year to get you to production? Um, the things you would expect. Um, certification takes a long time. It's a highly regulated industry, as you all know. Yeah. So there's a lot of uh, safety testing, uh, electrical usage testing, all sorts of stuff like that. That's what I'm building the prototypes for. That's what that's what our engineers are going to travel all over. You know, final tuning on stability control, all the ADAS systems. Um, yeah, it's it's tuning from here on out, pretty much. 
mostly software, yeah. mostly software tuning. Uh, yeah, mostly software tuning. I mean, there's obviously some tuning of things like you know uh, compounds or rubber bushings in the suspension. We may tweak some of that stuff still, but but yeah, it's well, knock on wood, it's it's tuning unless I find something in one of the tests that requires a change, right? Yeah, um, yeah it's durability testing and and tuning and, and a whole lot of software refinement from between now and then. You know, over the last 20, 30 years, uh, the structures of cars have gotten so much stiffer than they used to be. I mean, you go back to the 60s and before, and there was compliance in it, right? That was deliberate for that boulevard ride. Mm -hmm. uh, and now fast forward to today with electric cars with battery packs bolted to the bottom of the car. And uh, what I'm picking up on a lot of elect luxury electric cars mm -hmm. that I'm driving is it it excites everything you get plastic trim, buzzing, uh, you get a, a low resonance boom through the body. Are you encountering that? I mean, or is, is this, am I crazy here or are you working on things like that? Um, you're, you're not crazy, but that's also not unknown to us. All those things are things that we can easily model. So the road noise and that low frequency inputs, um, those aren't a surprise. So we've engineered the correct stiffnesses in the correct place in the body, the correct compliance in the right places. Um, so a lot of that stuff came out of the box on Celestic anyways, um, fantastic. You know, the the cast floor has an absolutely wonderful damping characteristic to it also. Um, so um, yeah, that that stiffness that comes from the whole lower structure being these, these nice castings is awesome. Um, but you're right, there's really no masking noise in an EV. So that's been a, a challenge we've known from the beginning. So we actually created a new uh, noise and vibe characteristic. You know, uh, we use grade letters. So, you know, a Cadillac would be a, a letter A for N and V. We created an A plus category for this car, which is even sometimes when we don't know how to model the difference or subjectively tell this is going to be better, but we know it's objectively better. We shoot for the objectively better one, even when we're not 100 percent sure it's worth much. And so we've redefined what we're doing, which is why it's laminated glass all the way around, including the roof mm. and just yeah, if, if there's something out there we knew how to do within reason, we've done it. If you need some objective opinions on this, uh, Frank, John, and myself will be happy to appear at Milford yeah. at any yes. time. Yeah, we'll, we'll put our butts in the seat any day you want. Okay, got it. Thanks for the offer. Appreciate that. <laughs> We're here to help. <laughs> Real good. Frank, any last questions? Well, like we pretty well covered it. I can't wait to get into yeah. the thing. Yeah. Tony, did we miss anything here? No, I don't think so. It's an exciting car. You guys ask great questions. It's been a good time. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about an epic product. Cool. With that, we're going to wrap it up. Tony Roma, thanks so much for your time. I can't wait to get into that car. I am floored that, you know, it was even approved to, to go into production. <laughs> Kudos to General Motors for, for doing this. I, I'm really impressed. And, and Frank and Richard, great having the both of you guys here too. Always a pleasure. Okay. So long, everybody, and thanks for tuning in. Thank you. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, solutions for your journey, and by Borg Warner, propulsion solutions that support a clean, energy efficient world. If you like this program and would like to learn more about the automotive industry, check out our website at autoline.tv or look for us on YouTube on the Autoline channel.